Welcome to Expresso Shots Live. My name is John, and in tonight's episode, we are going to be reaching out to the four candidates running for the position of Westport Councillor. Now, this is a unique situation where we have one position available, four people running, and it's for a one-year term until the next election. How did we decide to come up with these questions, you asked? Great that you asked. To keep things unbiased, these questions were submitted from the community. Approximately 35 questions were submitted, and we created a panel of three people. And those three people were Peggy Thompson, David Egan, and Stephanie Manston from the Victorian Inn. They selected the best five questions, narrowed it down to those best five questions, and those are the questions that we will ask tonight. So this is how the Meet the Candidate um, episode will work tonight. Uh, each candidate will have two minutes to introduce themselves, and they'll have two minutes each to respond to the five questions, and then a quick one-minute wrap-up um, or final kind of statement at the end. So stay tuned. This should be a great episode. I'm so pleased to be doing this again. I did it uh, three years ago, and uh, I'm back at it today. So stick with us and uh, enjoy this episode. Hi everybody, I'm Peggy Thompson and my husband and I, upon retirement, moved to Westport in 2017. Myself, along with David Egan and Stephanie Manstan, formed a small committee to review the 30 questions that were submitted for this interview. Still considered a newbie in Westport, I guess. I've only been here 11 years, but uh, what brought me here was uh, on boating trips, and uh, I love the town. It was a destination for us. But uh, a little bit about myself: I've been involved with uh, some other, not political things. But I was president of the Real Estate Association for uh, many years, um, being the youngest in Ontario. Uh, I was also the president of the Junior Chamber of Commerce. Uh, which kicks you out when you're 40 years old. So we've had a lot of experience with, uh, you know, doing things for the community, and uh, the real estate thing, uh, you know, part of delegation and uh, you know, 365 members uh, make everybody happy and uh, establish the bylaws and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, Business-wise, I've been in business all my life. Uh, I helped my father when I was going through college uh, in his grocery store, which is similar to the one that's in town here. Uh, it's uh, a learning experience and uh, a work ethic that he instilled in me, and it's been going on forever. Uh, the uh, experience I bring is the, the business aspect of, uh, and I think it should be run as a business, uh, the uh, dealing with small business and international uh, real estate from that to uh, manufacturing you know, medical supplies for the, uh, the doctors and veterinarians across the world and taking my concept across the world and dealing with different suppliers, different people, associating marketing, that sort of thing, which I think is a big thing that should be done, not just in business, but also in a community, uh, the marketing of the community, to draw people in. And uh, those are some of the things I want to uh, represent, and I think I have the experience for that. And I'm not downplaying the other candidates, I'm sure they're very worthy and knowledgeable as well, but it's uh, something that I can bring to the table. Uh, and that's why I ran, and some people encouraged me to run because of my past experience. Hand it over to you, Amy. Great. Thanks, John. Um, so some of you may or may not know, my name is Amy Cardi. Um, I was born and raised in Westport, and I'm very proud to call Westport home. Um, I love Westport. It's charm, it's businesses, uh, it's tourist appeal. Um, I'm very proud and honored for my husband Ryan and I to be able to raise our two daughters, Marin and Aubrey, here, and they're able to participate in some of the activities that uh, the village has. So baseball and the arena is a big one for us, and we're always out walking the streets. So that's a uh, you know it's a very important place for me. Um, it's something that I have always wanted to do, um, as my mother was the first female councillor for the village uh, about 41 years ago, and so I've always wanted to follow in her footsteps. Um, I do have a lot of opinions about the village, both positive and negative, and I have um, reached out to council through letters and emails and, and participating in meetings ab about how I feel, and now I just feel like it's time to put my money where my mouth is. And, uh, you know, I've been teaching for 15 years, so I'm always out, you know, with people, and, and that's something I really enjoy. And I love teaching. I actually taught your son for a little while. So um, I just, I'm doing this just to make Westport the best it can be. 
Well, here I am. So, hello, my name is Frank Huff, and I'm here to explain why I am the right choice to represent you as counselor in this beautiful village of Westport. I have lived here now for 10 years. I am a retired logistics operation manager, and I've been a manager throughout my whole working career. I am a husband to my wife, Heather, for 42 years. I have three grown sons. I have a beautiful granddaughter, and I have one on the way. I did represent you on council with many successes, such as FOTA, Friends of the Arena, the revitalization of Lockwood Park, and the countless, countless, countless hours of dedication and meetings for our wastewater rehabilitation project. I've been involved in raising thousands of dollars through my committees and events for FOTA and the park, and I was Lion of the Year, and currently now I am second vice president of the Westport Legion Branch 542. Please support your Legion and join today. My wife Heather is an active library board member and we both get involved in the many, many fundraisers here held in Westport. So you can see we are totally engaged with what's going on around here. So during the course of this interview, we would like to look at some of the deficiencies of this village. However, let us not forget the beauty and some of the positives of living in this beautiful village. Some of us can complain, however, I tend to brag a lot about where I live. This is the best place to live. Don't get me wrong, always room for improvement. However, we will work on this together. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Well, for those that don't know me, my name is Mark Parlow, and I've been a resident of the village now almost 25 years. Um, I, you know what, I, I look at it as, the, the, you know, the village has been great to me uh, over, the, over my 25 years here. I mean, I ran a business here for 15 of those 25 years. Um, and the village was great for supporting my business. So, you know, I think it's time that, that I give back. You know, I mean, I gave, I've given back. You know, I'm, I'm a member of the volunteer fire department here in Westport, and I have been, I've been doing that for oh, almost 15 years. Um, you know, anytime there's been something that I can try and help out, you know, Green Street Challenge is another awesome opportunity where, you know, we did some stuff for the kids. And, you know, it, it's just time that, that I, you know, I try and give back to the village itself. I've, I've done, you know, I've got a good business acumen behind me, so I think it's, it's a good fit for the village. Um, my other biggest thing for running is the fact that currently the village has, you know, it, it, it's a, council is a, a group of retirees right now and it's time that we get some younger blood in there and get some people in there that have some, some families, young families. I mean, you know, my daughter is only going on three now, so it's time for us to see some stuff that's going to help with the village and, and help for those younger families bringing in, you know, it's, it's been a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff for the retirees and retirees are great, don't get me wrong, they're, they're the backbone of, of the village, but you know, for the village to grow, we want to start bringing some younger families in, and we've got to look for things that's, that are going to generate those younger families to want to come and, and live here. And COVID is a is while it while it's been a detriment, it's been a bit of a blessing. It shows companies that you don't have to be in an office 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So, you know, the fact that they can we can move out farther out into smaller villages and and whatnot is a is a great opportunity for us. So I'm I'm looking for the opportunity to help the village grow in that direction for sure. The COVID situation clearly reduced residents' opportunity for questions, concerns, and discussion of different opinions with village officials. Decisions in council and cow meetings flow from recommendations in reports to council, and little debate of issues is evident. This election call prompted a majority of residents to question this decision, some in the form of a petition. Subsequent council discussion focused on information gathering rather than acknowledging their misreading of public opinion. Openness, transparency, and community engagement are identified as key values for our village government. Please discuss your commitment to these values. Go ahead, Renee. The, the biggest one to me was transparency. Uh, I came into this before I knew this question was going to come up, and uh, I understand the questions weren't as free-flowing as they normally would have been because they think it's a by-election, it's not as important. It is very important. The person that you're going to put in position right now is probably going to be there for the next five years. Hopefully. Uh, it's not a one-year term. It's, you know, one year now, but again, you need somebody in there. Transparency to me is very, very important. The residents and, and, and citizens of Westport and area need to know what the hell is going on in council and discuss it with an open mind. Have debates within the four people. The, the mayor being the final decision maker. 
but not have one person dominate the conversation or dominate what should be done or should be done. Keep an open mind, get the facts, and go from there. But let the people know what's going on and why you're doing this. Because you get a lot of people saying, you know, he didn't do his job. I'm just pointing that counselor out. But he is doing his job, but he just, they need that information. You know, uh, it's very important that you trust the counselor that you elect, whether it be now or next year, that uh, you have faith in him. And he, has, he represents you. He represents the, the, the township, uh, the, the area. Uh, so transparency, yes, very, very, that's number one on my priority thing. Uh, the idea that, you know, we, we have discussions. I didn't like the way the sidewalk went. So it, well, explain to the people why we didn't do this. They, they, I'm not knocking the present council because the, the road, fantastic. Finally got it done. But is it, you know, it's great. But the sidewalk, I'm a little concerned with. Again, I keep harping on transparency. To me, that's big, big, big. Thank you. Thanks, Renee. Floor is yours. Okay. So I'm just going to touch on each of these. Um, openness, I think it's uh, very important. I myself feel that I'm approachable, open to new ideas. And if COVID has taught me anything, it's uh, that I need to be open and go with the flow. I never thought I would be teaching in front of a, a computer. So it's just something that uh, it's very important. And with openness, I think inclusion for all and all ideas need to, to be heard. Uh, transparency. Um, I hope I am someone who people see as for the village, not for myself. Um, I feel transparency is key to a successful council and they need to maybe, you know, have some more dialogue there. Um, goals, ideas and bylaws, they need to be laid out for people to, to see and to read and to discuss. Uh, community engagement, uh, it's huge. We all want to feel part of something if, if we want to, right? And to feel like we belong. Um, you know, your uh, activity, it's not really an activity, your huge event on the weekend, Westport, shows just how important community engagement is. People were happy, people, you know, were filled the town and it just made me really proud. Other things like winter carnivals in the past that we used to have, that's really important for in community engagement. And things like the Lions Club, Santa Claus Parade, all those things make Westport a better place. And I think they're important. Um, I also feel one more thing should be included in this and it's respect. Uh, it's respect for each other and respect for our community. I am a positive person, but I'm also not a yes person. I, I'm not a pushover, so I'm not afraid to, you know, respectfully disagree with people and have my own opinions. So I just think we really need to focus on that as well as the other three key issues. Now you have two minutes to respond, Frank, so I'll just start the clock and uh, whenever you feel comfortable, go ahead. Okay. So, transparency, 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 transparency. I cannot say enough. These are core values I stuck with when I was on council and values that I, that I still stand for today. COVID has, has, made, has made us make a lot of adjustments in, in how we communicate with others because we had to. And we do it through Zoom and other tools. No excuse, openness and transparency should always be there regardless of the situation. When having meetings, I agree you need an agenda for structure. However, there should be a point where you're able to speak up and embrace in conversation, which promotes ideas. My term on council was like a think tank. We would toss around ideas, speak our mind while getting things accomplished. Meetings at times were long, however worth it. Yet I felt a sense of accomplishment, knowing we were working hard for the village. Also ideas come out of conversations on the street, engaging in the community, which I have done and continue to do so. I would propose that is mandated on, mandated on a rotating basis that a member of council each month visit and document maybe 25 homes or some, bus or some of the businesses of what concerns them, or maybe they want to give positive feedback. It's just communication. So this should give back to council, uh, this should come back to council for all to discuss and for everybody to hear. Residents and businesses might want to speak up about something, however, may be shy, thinking council does not care what they think. Let's open up lines of communications to our businesses and residences. I never found it a problem to over communicate. I find it a problem 
not to communicate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Mark. Well, thanks for that. And you know, during during the last term of council where I sat, um, you know, I I pushed the whole time I was there for transparency. You know, every one of our meetings that that you know wanted to be closed, I objected to. I you know, I I, I firmly believe that the only way this that there can be transparency is if we don't hide things. We don't hide behind closed doors. We have things open and, and let everybody come and, and see where we are. You know, and, and, you know, there was a few times where in the village where we had to discuss issues, you know, legal issues, whether it be employee issues or things like that, and we had to close it, and I get that. But, you know, this, this council often speaks of having complete and open transparency. And unless you're willing to ensure that the council is truly run, those are just words that they're using. Um, you know, and they're empty buzzwords for that. And I mean, when you think about it, the council so far just this year alone, you know, has had six closed meetings in nine months. You know, that, that's almost one a month. And I mean, even on some of those closed meetings, there was, you know, more than one issue discussed. So, you know, we've got to look at it and, you know, we, we can't be doing business behind closed doors. And if we're not holding these meetings in a public forum and the council is dealing with so many legal issues, perhaps townspeople need to ask why 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 are there so many legal issues that are all of a sudden coming up that we have to hide it behind closed doors you know and, and I don't think we need to hide things from our elected from the people that elected us we need them to understand why we make these decisions and and how we're making them it's not just you know it's just we're making them it, we, we've got to give them that background behind it so you know just because the municipal act says that we can have a closed meeting doesn't mean we need to so and you know I, I, I you know I, I make the commitment that again if I if they if Council, or if the townspeople sent me send me back to, to work on their behalf, that I'm going to fight for open meetings every chance I get. You know, I, I think it everybody should be able to come in and do what they want to do and see it, and and we shouldn't hide behind the closed meeting thing about you know we do it because we can. You know, and that's really the way I look at it. So, yeah. thanks, Mark. Westport Harbor consistently generates significant revenue for the village, recently more than $100 per foot of deck. In 2017, Council received a report recommending the deteriorated Goat Island docks should be replaced at an estimated cost of $400,000. Only $38,000 has been spent on replacement since that time, less than harbour net revenue. Why do you believe our harbor is, or is not, critical infrastructure for the local economy? Given that the Westport Harbor is a valued asset for the community, how would you plan to maintain and or expand the facilities? The harbor is definitely our jewel to Westport. Always has and always will. We have the and amenities to shopping, entertainment, banking, scenery, etc a perfect spot to park your boat and enjoy everything that the village has to offer. With all these positives, there presents some negatives. I did have the opportunity to work at the harbor one summer and seen firsthand the repairs and the upgrades needed. I have not done the cost estimate that the village says about $400,000, however, most likely it is a good number. There have been also studies on a pump out and gas. And I can tell you while I was working there, some boaters did leave because we did not offer that service. Also, while campaigning, a resident mentioned the washrooms and the showers should be closer to the boaters. Other comments were a play area, beach for swimming, weekend entertainment, barbecue, and the list goes on. These are all things to consider. However, it takes a lot of money. How do we get it? We could look at raising the per foot charge made by another 10%. Now I was talking to the harbor master about this and he says that would bring in maybe 10, 10K a year, which is it'll take 40 years to reach our goal. More money from our budget, which is already tight, not sure that's gonna happen. Get the taxpayers to pay more, could be an issue too. The most viable option is to keep looking at the grants out there. We were successful with the Bedford Street project and our wastewater system and we did not have the funds for the project this size. We did get the grants for those. We can dump ten dollars to $20,000 each year into the harbor. However, these are all Band-Aid solutions. It needs a revitalization project. Also on a side note, 
Labote is adding more to the fleet for next year. I believe we need to strike a deal with them to build their own dedicated dock here such as they did in Sealy's Bay. This would free up our docks for more overnighters, which in turn will, will increase revenue for the businesses in the village. Thanks a lot, Frank. Well, uh, I truly believe that the harbour is a critical infrastructure for our local economy. Um, boaters for the day or for an extended period of time come to our village, they dine in, they, they get takeout in all our restaurants, they you know, go to our stores and they purchase merchandise. So I think they're invaluable to, to our economy. Um, I, I enjoy myself going down and, and crossing the bridge and seeing all the boats and I feel like a tourist in my own town. And this summer when I did go down and, you know, it was full the majority of the time, it was, it was really something uh, great to see. Now, that being said, it does cost a lot of money to maintain and improve the harbour. I, I know that and I think most of the village knows that as well. Um, I have it, read the revenues and the expenses and the net profits for the harbour and in my opinion I, I think there's maybe like three possible ways that we could um, improve on the harbour and obviously the first one is grants either both federally or provincially. Um, grants are key to you know helping some of these uh, things get off the ground. Um, Number two, we, we could be borrowing some money, and I know that might scare some people, but uh, we need to make these improvements. And I know we can only borrow 25% of what we own, but maybe that's a possibility if that's what the people would like. Um, and the third thing that we could maybe look at is like a pay-as-you-go system for these boaters, um, sort of like parking lots do now. Um, these are just things that I've been thinking about. They, they might not be good ideas, but they're ideas that we could have a discussion about the harbor is very important and we need to make sure that we are maintaining it and improving it. Go ahead Renee. Uh, the harbor to me is a big big influence on, on generating people into our area. Uh, Kevin is doing a fantastic job and I think his hands are kind of tied with wanting to do things that are quite capable of getting done. Uh, I know you have to deal with the St. Lawrence Parks Commission because of their restrictions but they can expand this thing. And I'd like to know, you're making more profit. You're making like $38,000 in profit. Where's that money going? Obviously, it's not going back into the harbor because they haven't done anything for a few years. Uh, so where is it going? Um, again, there, there is grants out there. There's a tourism grants for that sort of thing. They, if they don't want to expand the actual harbors, put uh, moor bars there, just like big balloons out there. Put them out there so people can dock and get their little dinghy and come into town. It's a big, big draw. Westport is a destination place for many people, especially boaters uh, from the Quebec side. Uh, it's not only that, when, once they come here from boaters, they come here by car. They come here maybe, gee, I'd like to retire here, as we did, or live here, and open up a business, which increased more economy. Uh, it's, it's a big, big plus. Uh, they're talking about you know putting more money into the arena, which is a loss situation. I mean, it's a sidebar from the harbor, but it's losing money every year, supposedly. Well, I'd like to know who's handling the marketing of the arena. That arena should not be losing money. There's ice time is very, very valuable, and everybody's looking for ice time. Being a hockey person for all my life, and now my grandkids are big time into hockey, yes, they, they, they're looking for ice time. Why isn't it available? Why aren't we marketing this thing as something else? I'm with the Lions Club, which I enjoy, a good community organization, uh, and in charge of the rentals. I generate thousands of dollars every year from rentals, just from what we have. Why can't they do the same thing up here? It's all one and one. Don't let one person handle one thing, the harbor, and another person. Think. Get somebody in there that knows what they're doing, marketing, both, with the help and suggestion from Kevin, because he definitely knows what he's doing. So that's my thing. Harbor is very vital. It brings in a lot of tourists now and in the future. Thank you, Ed. You know, the harbor is part of the village that's, you know, really near and dear to my heart. My backyard's directly across the, across the harbor from it. So, you know, I get to see on a daily basis what goes on um, in the harbor itself. You know, during my time on council, the last go-round, um, you know, I pushed for a revitalization of the harbor. I mean, the harbor is really, when we think about it, one of the only two revenue streams other than, tax, other than taxation that we have, you know. and, and People may argue with me that the, the arena is a revenue stream. When you look at it, the plus minuses, we lose money on the arena. So when it comes down to it, really, the harbor is our only 
only way of getting money that doesn't come from taxpayers itself, you know. And and when we talk about it, I mean, you know, the, the last rendition of the of the Harbor Committee that I was part of, we we laid out a whole expansion plan. It was you know new dockage. It was you know opening up an area that we could rent out for people to have weddings or corporate events on and all sorts of that things. And and you know when we started to look at it. Um, you know, we, when we started to look at ways to fund it, you know, there was grants and everything else that we were that we were trying to go with. But you know, at the time, the committee was never allowed to to apply for those grants because you know the mayor told us that she wanted the grants for the pavilion in the park or something else. And I mean, you know, we've got to look at at you know where where we get our revenue. You know, while the pavilion may be great, it doesn't generate money for the village. The harbor does. I mean. You know, when you look at this year alone, even with COVID, the last numbers I saw um, were somewhere in the vicinity of $130,000. Now, how much of that is, you know, before tax revenue and all the rest of that, I can't answer because it was just one lump sum number. But, you know, when you think about in a COVID year that we've spent or we've made, you know, in income in it at $130,000, imagine what we could do if we had double the boat space or double the places where people could dock or, you know, we had more seasonals. It gives us an opportunity that's huge out there and we've, we've got to invest money in it. And if we don't invest, we're not going to get anything back from it. So it's irresponsible in my opinion to just continue to ignore the harbour. Tourism is essential to the health of our community. To support local businesses, what action should the village undertake to increase the number of visitors outside of the peak demand summer months? So tourism, Westport is tourism, especially in the spring, summer and fall. The winter, not so much as, you know, the villagers all know, but tourism is is Westport. So I feel like there's certain things that we could maybe tap in a little bit more on. Um, what's on Westport is, is amazing and it gets people's ideas and events out. And so maybe there's uh, kids that would look for volunteer hours where they could target a restaurant or a business and that could be like the business of the month. And it doesn't necessarily have to be what's on Westport, but it could maybe be part of that where we focus on, oh, what does this business do and what do they have to offer and what are their hours and what restaurants, what do they what do they provide and, you know, are they gluten free and, and different things like that. And just social media is huge and people, people, that's where we go. I go to my phone if I want to know what's going on or where to go and times for things. So I think social media, um, we need to tap into that for our tourism. Um, and I think the village, they would support any any of the project initiatives from the business community because like they're the heart of our community, right? These businesses, we want to keep them growing. We want new businesses. Um, some different events that tourism, we have been working on in tourism, the Christmas gift of light, it just kind of got off the ground last year. Um, I was uh, one of the street captains, so there was lights provided for people that they could use and, and they didn't have to pay for them. And there was different people going around and putting up lights for people. And uh, those are just really good community events that don't necessarily cost a lot of money for some people. Um, other things like economy and tourism like they're connected to me and they, they they're often the same thing so we just need to make sure that businesses are happy and villages are happy and like just there's so much the Westport Arts Council when they have their their amazing uh, photo contest you know like we could do some winter ones as well tourism is a strong component of what keeps this village alive it is true in the winter months it can be slow uh, a little difficult, quiet. Some days you could shoot a cannon down Bedford Street and it wouldn't hit anything. Council does have an economic and development committee which is defined to expand and grow the economy. I have not seen much of that lately, much come out of that lately. Maybe it needs a name change, something like Winter Tourism Committee, and switch their focus on bringing in events like the Arts Council does. Also dedicate some budget money to advertising on a broader scale. What's on Westport here does a tremendous job of promoting us. However, we need council to think tank on winter events and budget money to promote. We owe it to the businesses, business community here in Westport. Without them, we will suffer. They are part of our infrastructure. 
we need to do something about this now. Mark? Well, Westport has a has a wonderful core of all season residents, you know, who give the village the vibe and a sense of community that everyone who lives here is proud to be part of it. But as the saying goes, love doesn't pay the rent. What keeps the village thriving and alive are the tourists and the wonderful business community. Without tourists, cottagers flocking to Westport every year, our village would eventually experience the same the same fate as Delta, with an empty storefronts in their core. At the last committee of the whole meeting, I, I listened to the mayor mention that she wanted to, you know, amalgamate tourism committee and, and act dev committee back into one because everybody thinks it's just tourism that, that runs this village. And, you know, when we start to look at, at everything that's around this village, we need to attra attract people that are willing to open businesses here because without the businesses, we don't have a tourism committee to deal with or we don't have tourism to deal with. And I mean, when you think about it, I mean, right now, the, the old, I think it's, it, was, it was called Cottage Country Building, it's going through a renovation. It's going to be looking for more people to, to rent and to, and to fill that space. So we need those people to run through in order to keep it going. And, and you know, when we think about it, I mean, we've got to show that Westport itself is open for business. And, and the last thing we need is, you know, the, the village's idea of a revenue stream is let's start, let's start writing tickets on Saturdays and Sundays when, when we're full of tourists here and tourists are going to pay their money. I mean, that, that's just going to give Westport a bad name and people are going to start to avoid it because, oh, don't go there. They're just looking to, to, to write tickets and get us away from it. So, you know, we've really got to look at the whole thing and we've got to say, you know, we've got to look at ways, surefire ways of enticing those tourists to come in and avoid it. And, and you know, the, the, the Westport Festival that we just had this weekend was an awesome way of doing that. I mean, you know, that the, the, the things I heard from the people that showed up are looking forward to it next year. And it's small things like that that are going to, to keep Westport on the market and, and on people's radar and going to drag them to come back in. So, you know, we need to keep tourism up, but we also need to push some economic development and have people show up. Great. Okay, ready? Mm -hmm. yours. Okay, and I'm not, and I thank you for that question. And I looked at that, looked at that. And I'm not saying this because you're both sitting here, but I, my, my comment to that is, Look at Cynthia and John Pringle, what they have done for this community and their business, creating events, hop shop, what you did this weekend. It was phenomenal. The streets were packed. Everybody benefited from that. People that were never here before came because of that. Same with your thing. The, uh, you know, they have the market out here in the summertime, in the wintertime. That's generating people into the area. And we need people like you or somebody that the, the township should be, I call it a township, should be involved with, whether it be a councillor or somebody else, to make sure that these things are happening. There's Corn Fest. Uh, Portland has their skating thing in the wintertime. Draws thousands, it's an international skating thing. It draws thousands of people. We need people to realize that Westport is here. It's a beautiful little town. And it's getting bigger and bigger, which draws me to another question. But anyway, let's keep it with the, with the tourism right now. Uh, again, kudos to you guys. You're, you're doing fantastic. Uh, they should pay you for what you're doing. There are uh, other opportunities. I can't think, I know, I've, I've been involved with Corn Fest in Cornwall. I've been involved with the Chamber in Cornwall to do a lot of these things to off season. Uh, a home and trade show in the spring, a home and trade show in the, in, the, in the fall, where people bring their, their goods. We have the arena, we have the, the, the grounds outside to do these things. Don't rely on individuals like yourself to do all that, because it's a big responsibility. The, the township, council, sure, their members should be involved with that and could, form a committee to get these things going off the ground. And once it becomes one, Marty did a great thing on the beach this year. It draw a lot of people, and it's free. You don't have to charge for everything. It's not all about money, just generating some, in, not income, but tourism, people enjoy coming to Westport. And that's what I want to create, to have that feeling, you know, I want to be here. Great, thank you. And thank you for mentioning my name in that conversation as well. <laughs> I, I, I do appreciate it. Approximately 60% of the people living in Westport are over 50 years of age and future new residents are expected to increase this number. The village has no programs, services or infrastructure specifically for seniors, although there are some private seniors residences. Concern has been raised about continued affordability and opportunities for seniors residential transitioning watercolor plans do not respond to this opportunity. 
What do you think the village should be doing for its seniors? Because I'm almost going to be one of those seniors, that uh, this is very, very uh, important to me. The people that live here, the seniors that live here now, have been here all their lives, basically. And as they get on an age, they can't handle the house anymore. It's too big or whatever, or they get a responsibility. And they can't afford the taxes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yes, there should be some other small communities have senior homes where people can live in the village they grew up in and, and make it accessible to, you know, to them. Uh, it, it's a big part of our lives. I mean, I don't want to compare Canada to Europe because Europe takes care of their seniors, and you know that, being Dutch <laughs> as I am. Is, uh, we have to look after those people. Uh, they, they want to stay here. They don't want to move somewhere else. They don't want to be put in a home somewhere, you know, 10 miles away, even if their kids live 10 miles away. They want to be in their community. And there are ways, and I don't know why this hasn't been investigated. Watercolor, fine. They came in with a proposal, affordable housing, $300,000 plus. Thousand, thousand yeah, it's, it's affordable, I guess, today. But now, all of a sudden, it's $700,000. There is no room in their program, or I see, or I've heard of, that is going to be, you know, there is a room there for the affordable housing or senior homes. Great places that, uh, you know, the, the marketplace that we have in the summertime. That's a great stuff. Somebody get in here, build a senior home in there, a two-story level or whatever. I mean, a dozen units. You know, the government subsidizes a lot of these things. Look at things like that. You know, and look at, again, I know the particular seniors, but look at bringing in friendly, uh, environmental friendly businesses into town to keep the younger people here so they have a job here so they continue on, which generates some tax revenue as well. These are some things that be, the township, township should be looking at, you know, and investigating. It's out there. Just go out and get it. Uh, thank you. First off, many of our seniors are between 75 to 90 and over. We need a wellness check program. During my campaigning, I did come across an aging senior who says they are alone with, with not much contact with others. This is unacceptable. Has the system failed? Absolutely. We need to make a list of the most vulnerable and develop a checklist that covers off all qualities of life. Then put together a group of dedicated volunteers from our community to do a check with them and report back to our health agencies. Some individuals tend to keep to themselves, especially if they are lonely and depressed. We can make this happen. Westport is a community of caring volunteers. Now, as per programs, there are a lot of impact exercise programs offered by Rideau Lakes. However, this has been difficult due to the COVID. We also have individuals in Westport who offer yoga and wellness classes. Maybe this should be advertised on our village website. I also noticed there seems to be a yoga stretching class most mornings at the basketball court in Lockwood Field. Now the future does look encouraging with the proposed arena expansion. This could provide possibly a daily drop-in center for our seniors with programs offered by our village. Now let's talk about affordable housing. We have the opportunity now to revisit some of the plans watercolors to look at the more to plans with watercolors to look at the more affordable housing and senior residences. Not sure why this has not been addressed. Maybe it has. And if it has, it should be communicated for all us to re as I've received numerous concerns over this while I was campaigning. Now I I would love to acknowledge our service groups, such as the Legion and the Lions Club. They do a tremendous job with the seniors. However, I do realize we need to do more. All right, Amy, I push the button. Thank you. Uh, so Westport is a place where many people come uh, to retire, and, and they move here even before retirement. But there is no place for seniors to, to call home right now, to gather and meet and interact with one another. Um, seniors need a place to call home and feel, I feel that the new FODA um, village initiative uh, is a great start. So it was unveiled at the village picnic uh, beginning of this month where uh, there will be an addition put on to the arena as it is now and there will be a meeting room for seniors and an elevator uh, put in so it will be accessible. And I think that that's a really good start for them to have a place to call home. 
And so we're on the right track with that. And I think we just need to keep the momentum going for that. And, and maybe if we have some conversations with seniors, I know that the village had a survey about Lockwood Park. So maybe we need a survey for seniors, you know, what, what do they want to see and, and what do they want uh, provided for them? Um, another thing I've realized in the last couple of years with COVID is connection. Connection is huge and many of these seniors, not all of them, but many of them are a lot more isolated now. So I, I was thinking something that would be really neat is either it's like an adopt a senior. So either a family or our local school, some classrooms could um, adopt a, a senior and they could either write letters or they could get on Teams or Zoom and read a book together or something like that so that they just feel connected. And it's something really great for the young and old alike to to maybe participate in. So that's just kind of where I was thinking that's an easy thing for people to do and then, you know, it's a sense of, of community for everybody. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it's un, unfortunately it's not just the seniors that have a problem. I mean, it's, it's attracting, you know, people itself to the village. They, we want to get people to move here, <clears throat> excuse me. And I think many of us were really excited when we heard about, you know, the, the whole development up there and, and how it was going to include some starter homes and it was going to be a, a, a place where, you know, middle income people could start to look at it. And, you know, for, you know, a place where seniors could, could move into smaller housing and, and downside to where they are. But, you know, in my opinion, one of the biggest mistakes council is making is allowing the developer to deviate from this plan of subdivision that he had. If you look at the first initial plan of subdivision, there was an apartment block in there, there was some, some town, a townhouse block in there, and, and this new developer has decided he's gonna blow those away, he's not putting them up. And, and that's what, what we need as a village in order to bring more people in. We need that affordable housing aspect of it. I mean, when you look at the condo on Rideau Street, those things go up and they don't even hit the market. People find out that they're going they're going up for sale and other people are jumping on them before they even, I mean, before they've even had time to put a for sale sign up. So smaller places that are affordable are needed. And this this village is is missing out on that opportunity by not holding the developer to the, the, the plan of subdivision. I mean, there are things that are going on. I mean, when we look at the arena, for example, the, you know, the Friends of the Arena or FOTA has done an amazing job of what they're doing. And the whole idea of, of bringing that, you know, the addition to it, to, to bring places where seniors can come together and all that, that is amazing. But that's not the village. The village is having no part of that. And it's those type of things where the village needs to stand up and say, hey, we see this need, we've got to deal with it, and we've got to make it worthwhile. We can't just give a developer a, a blank check and here are the keys to the village and do what you need to do and we're just happy that you're here. We are, but we've got to hold him accountable and we've got to get things that are good for the village included in what he's doing and not just let him have, have run of the, of, of the way to do it. So we've got to deal with that. Additional village revenues will be realized from the watercolor development. Other than necessary spending for infrastructure growth, would you see any opportunities to reduce the tax burden on local businesses and potential new businesses to Westport? Amy? Okay. Well, I feel like the tax burden is on everybody in the village. Um, I know the watercolor, it's here, and I've been watching it develop as it's in my backyard, and it just, it's something that is here, so we need to figure out how we are going to, to best, um, you know, work with it. There's positives and negatives. Some people are very much for watercolor. Some people are very much against it. Um, as far as I can see and understand, an increase in the tax base will benefit all tax payers because there's revenue coming in. Um, and that's, that is my, from what I can read from that, and that's what I, I feel, but I, I, you know, I'm open to, to discussions as well, for sure. Um, that being said, um, I would like to see the next phase or rollout of the watercolors to maybe have some more affordable housing for people, um, for young families and seniors. Um, just it may be some townhouses or something, but just maybe something a little more affordable for, for young families and seniors alike. And I'm not very long on this one. It's, it's and okay. I don't have a lot to say about it, so sorry about that. Yes, no problem. Um, the Harbour and Arena, they are our revenue generators. 
These could be topics for the Winter Tourism Committee, which I proposed earlier. The arena, as we know, has not generated that income to be put has not generated income to be put in a positive situation. Hard to increase ra rates currently as we need to keep the revenues we have. However, more advertising money should be used to promote our arena for public skating, which in turn promotes tourism for the village. Summer months at the arena could be better utilized, such as pickleball courts, ball hockey, concerts, wedding. The community center needs to be a multi-function facility year-round to generate revenue for the village. Pretty sure FOTA has that in the plans for the future. Another revenue stream could be a tourism tax. Niagara Falls currently has a $2 per room per night stay tax. This money either could be allocated to the harbor or to the businesses and they could do whatever they want with it, maybe to beautify, maintain the village, just make it look pretty or awesome. Anyways, we need to work at promoting and maintaining the ones we have. Sorry. <laughs> we are a unique village, and we have unique shops that are interesting to our tourists. Expansion could be with more business. However, I don't agree at this time. We need to work at promoting and maintaining the ones we have now. The pandemic has put us in a has put a damper on our tourism and sales, and we need to concentrate on what we currently have. We owe it to our businesses now. They are still the core of the village success, and once we bounce back, then let's look at new opportunities. Thank you. Go ahead, Rodney. Uh, I think that if we, we try to uh, generate some small businesses, uh, again, environmentally friendly, uh, to give them a tax break is a good thing because we're creating jobs and we're creating you know, an establishment here and people want to move here, which creates more housing. But we also have to take care of the housing situation, which right now, to me, is uh, not affordable to most people. You know, you're making a ton of money, fine, uh, but that's not the norm anymore. Uh, taxes haven't gone up in this town. Uh, last year it didn't go up at all. The year before that it was 1.5% which is very reasonable. So they're going to do a great job on keeping the taxes at a minimum. If we talk just for business, yeah, to me, can we drop them? You know how it goes. Once taxes involved, there's no way it's going to be lowered, you know, just like income tax or anything else. GST was supposed to be temporary. It's not going to be temporary. It's there. Uh, I think it's ridiculous the amount of business tax we pay. Like, I, I don't know what you pay, but I have a business, and we pay over $8,000 a year for, for taxes. That almost kills people stay in business. So maybe there is ways to do that. I don't know, but you have to look at it and find somebody that does know. An economic development person, you need somebody in place like that. You can't rely on just four people and a mayor and a CEO doing that, you know, all this stuff. You need to hire professional people, know what they're doing, find out how we get the tax breaks and how we get, get the government involved to help us with these things, like we did with the roads and the sidewalks. Sidewalks, again, different issue, but anyway. That's a sidebar. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> uh, there are ways. And why it's been taking so long or why they haven't done it before, I have no idea. I'm just saying, uh, with, with what I, my background is, yes, I, delegation is a big thing. You can't take it on yourself. You, you know, the mayor can't say, OK, this is the way it's going to be, and boom. No, we have to discuss this, and we have to get professionals to do this. Or a counselor can say, because of personal reasons, I want this done. No, it's not done. It's done as a whole. I want to create a team here. No, not just one or two individuals because of pride or anything else. It is a team effort. The five people in that room make a team effort and a team decision, not just one or two people. Thank you. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, when it comes to additional revenue, I mean, the, the, other than taxation, the, there really isn't much more that the village can do. I mean, you know, it's there. You know, other than we have the arena and we have the harbor. We need to look at what we can do to get those up to where we can where we can use them where they're at. I mean, you know, as I said earlier, FOTA's done a great job at, at renovating the arena. You know, and they're they're doing a great job of pushing for the expansion of the arena. But when it comes to it, you know, we've got to look at the harbor. The harbor is the boating community flocks to Westport. I mean, you can go down there and look in in you know June and July, those docks are packed. 
But the docks are falling in. I mean, you can't walk on them right now without without fear of going through them. You look at the way that the island itself is eroding from underneath them. We've got to deal with all of these things. And the villages is, and, and this council has pretty much had their head in the sand about it. You know, give Barry Card his credit that, you know, he's been pushing that I can see about getting the, 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 the engineering um, discussion done and trying to get some feedback on that. But it appears that they spend money in, in, in my opinion, some of the silliest ways. I mean, you know, somebody mentioned earlier on that, you know, they, they spent $30,000 so far. That was for one little section of dock and, and, and to put and to repair a dock that almost nobody uses. So we've got to look at, at saying, you know what, we've got to invest. We, we, we see this as the jewel of what we've got and we want to turn around and, and change it. And like I said, the Harbor Committees have been, for some reason, have have been at loggerheads when it comes to council. I mean, and this was long before I was on council. I mean, I can think back of the day when Terry and, and Roscoe and all the rest of them were on there and they threw up their hands and walked away because the village just seems to be anti-harbor. It's where we've got to go. If we want to, if we want to look at ways of reducing taxation, we've got to look at what we've got in our arsenal that can actually deal with it. And, and the harbor is there. Yes, it's going to cost us some money. Yes, we've got to invest in it. But in the long run, it's going to save us a heck of a lot more in the long run and lessen our taxation than what it is right now. So we've got to do it, whether we like it or not. Nice. Well, that's the five questions. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, so I guess your, your plea to the, uh, to the voters uh, as to why they should vote for you and give us a bit of a wrap-up summary. Well, thanks, John. And, and like I said earlier, you know, I, I was honored on the last, the last go round of council where they, they elected me and, and put their faith in me. And I'm just asking them to do the same. I mean, I, I plan to be that same person. I'm, you know, I, I plan to ask the questions. I mean, currently right now, our council doesn't seem, you know, every, when I, as I've been doing, going around door to door and talking to people, you know, their, their biggest complaint is that they don't hear any questions. It's, you know, it's, it's just, Things come across their desk and everybody votes yes and nobody questions it and, and there's nothing, there's no discussion about any of it. And and I, I promise to the village and I, I've said this to people that I've met on the street is that I'm going to ask those tough questions whether they like it or not. That's my job. When, when, when we get elected as councillors it's not to do what's easy. It's not because well I don't want to rock the boat. It's not that you know it's not worth the fight or any of the things I've heard from other council members when, they're, when, when I discuss it with them. That's our job. Our job is to ask those tough questions and to make sure that the villages you know the, 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 the electors that have elected us, their answers are given and, and they understand it and, and that we can say, this is why we've done what we've done. So I'm just asking people for their vote on, on October 18th to vote for me and I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna make sure that, that we do it. And I mean, the other big thing as well is that, you know, th there is going to be a learning curve. So, you know, the fact that I've already been there, it's only, you know, by the time we get, you know, sworn in and everything else, there's only a couple of months left. You know, I, I can hit the ground running, and I already know what's involved there, so I can start. I can just continue on as if I'd never, I'd never left. So, you know, I'm asking for that vote of confidence and being able to, to say to people, you know, yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna represent them as best I can. Man, thanks for your time, Mark. I do appreciate it. Thanks very much. Good luck Mark. in the election. Thanks very much. You have a great day. Wrap up. Final thoughts uh, for the voters uh, going to the polls in mid October as to why they should uh, consider putting a check mark on, under by your name. Do right. I get five minutes on this one? You get uh, you get two <laughs> minutes, and it starts now. Okay. So we have four good candidates for this position. However, I'm here to explain why I am the better choice. One, I served on council. Two, I had successes on council. Three, my continued involvement in the community. Four, I'm transparent and engaged. Five, I'm retired, dedicated 24 seven, and no working around a person's work schedule. Now let's talk about what I believe is the definition of a counselor. One who's available 24 seven and engages in the community on a regular basis with the businesses, service groups, social events, fundraisers, tourists, and residents, which I do. A counselor is not a privilege, it's a job, and it's not, and it's not just in the boardroom, but boardroom it's, on the, it's in the street. I heard the comments through this campaign about being old and, and need to be young to do this job, and we do not have fresh ideas. Are you kidding me? That's a load of crap. 
You know, tell that to all the service group volunteers who are, most, who are mostly older than me that make decisions on the well-being of this village. I still have to make daily decisions for the well-being of my family. Plus, a retired person can dedicate all their time 24-7 to the council job and not have council try and work around work schedules of working individuals, which was a problem when I was on council. We talked about the problems. Now let's reflect on the many positives of, that our village has. That is why I chose to move here, retire here, and enjoy life here. Remember, it's not about how many signs you see in the village or how big they are, how beautiful they are, uh, the promises that people make. It is about the compassion and the strong work ethic that one brings to the job each day, every day, and that's what I would do now, and that's what I would do again in the future. I am all in, I want this job, and I will run again in the next term. Thank you, remember October 18th, make a difference, come out and vote, and I just wanted to note, Hazel McCallion was mayor of Mississauga until she was 93. <laughs> Thank you very much, Frank. Appreciate your time. Okay. Um, good luck in the election. And uh, he's up. You've got uh, you've got two minutes to, to to tell people why they should vote for you and, and what you really stand for. It'll make your last kind of a uh, pitch. So whenever you're ready, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I basically almost said everything I've had to say by answering the questions. Uh, I think the most important thing right now I wanted to, to, to discuss with people, and I, I'm looking around this weekend and. Uh, the signs out there, and somebody came into the store today and says, "Don't you have signs?" <laughs> you know, I'm going, "Yeah, they were supposed to be here last week, but I got lost in the crack somewhere." Anyway, they're on their way, and he said, "Well, as soon as you get, let me know and put them in my sign." I already have a sign there, but I told that person that I'm putting a sign on your lawn too, on, on my lawn too, my sign, which I really, really appreciate. I'm not going to go door to door. The others have, I, I assume, um, and. Uh, because of COVID situation, the I don't want to invade your privacy. I don't want to sit 10 feet back from your porch to go talk to a screen and saying, okay, what can I do, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I will put my signs out there. I'll put my bio out there, which you've heard somewhere today, but people that don't see this will see this in print somewhere down the road. Uh, I will try to make as many phone calls as possible. I can't be any worse than any telemarketer, but you know, I will try to contact with people that way and find out what their concerns are and what I can do for them. I just want to be here for the people. But the most important thing I want to emphasize to the residents of Westport, this is not just a so-so election for one year. It is an election that's for somebody that you trust and want to be, be there for you and listen to you. You know, you don't tell them. You listen to them, and they'll tell you what you want. But vote, whether it be me or anybody else, but vote. Please come out and vote for the person that you think is going to be responsible. And handle the, the situation that you're you know, concerned about. That's the most important thing right there. You have to get out and vote, whether it be me or anybody else. Well, thank you very much, Renee. Thank you. Good luck in the election. Well, in conclusion, what would you like to say to your voters as to maybe why they should vote for you or what, what they should consider when they're going to the polls? Okay. Uh, so I may not have a lot of experience with policy and procedure, but I am a fast learner and a hard worker, and I do want what's best for the village. Um, like I said earlier, I am positive, but I'm also, I'm not a pushover and I'm not afraid to stand up for what I think is right. Um, I'm running for everybody within the village because I want to make a positive impact. Um, I'm approachable, I'm friendly, and I, I, you know, when I walk the streets, I, I love being able to say hi to people and I feel like that's what makes Westport so special, okay? Our restaurants, our businesses, and our citizens are amazing and most of our sidewalks are pretty good now too they're getting there <laughs> um but i don't want to be negative and tear everyone down i want to fix problems um in issues with respect and make westport a better place for everyone so i guess in closing my main thing that i really want to say is on october 18th vote amy cardi for westport council and if you can't get out on the 18th um there is an advanced poll on October 13th, and I hope I have your support, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Amy. Thanks. Have a great day. Thanks.